Four straight top tens for Ty Gibbs, four straight 30ths for Zane Smith. We're going to look at some pleasant and not so pleasant early season surprises. How's it going, y'all? My name is Eric. Welcome to Out of the Groove. We're one month into the NASCAR season, so today we're going to look at who's hot and who's not to begin the year. But first, this episode is sponsored by pristineauction.com. If you don't know about pristineauction.com, they are the most trusted sports memorabilia and collectibles auction site. Auctions on pristineauction.com start at just $1 and each day thousands of signed items are available so you can win signed authentic signatures at affordable prices. Every item on pristineauction.com comes with a certificate of authenticity from the industry's most reputable authenticators. Pristineauction.com is your one-stop shop for NASCAR memorabilia, collectibles, and so much more. Upgrade your collection today and get $10 off your first winning purchase by using registration code ERIC. Click that top link down in the description below. Use registration code ERIC to get $10 off. Thank you to Pristine Auction for sponsoring the show. 48 hours later and the entire industry is still buzzing about what they saw at Bristol Motor Speedway, a glorious old school short track tire management race. Taken to the extreme, sure, but it's produced some great clips like this one Chase Briscoe shared on social media yesterday, a POV from his passenger seat that final run when he had already pit for fresh tires and everyone around him was struggling to survive. Gosh, look at these closing rates. This looks like an arcade game. This looks like Baby Park in Mario Kart if you raced at like negative 50 cc. <laughs> Unbelievable clip. I love when drivers share their POVs You know, later in the week. Allows fans to pick up on some details that they may not have seen during the broadcast on Sunday. So that was awesome. The TV ratings for Sunday's race at Bristol were also quite awesome. Just over 3.8 million viewers watched Sunday's cup race on Fox. That's an 11% increase over Atlanta on the same weekend last year and a 10% increase over Bristol Dirt last year, which aired a couple weeks later in the year on Easter Sunday. It's worth noting that this year's Bristol Spring Race went up against the NCAA March Madness Selection Show show and the final round of the players championship. That makes that 10% increase all the more significant because last year it was Spring Phoenix that went up against those two events and Phoenix was down 14%. So to go from down 14 to up 10% is a pretty positive swing. Plenty of factors at play here. You know, It was a very interesting race. I'm sure word of mouth via social media got some folks to tune in. Could still be feeling some positive effects from that Atlanta race a few weeks ago, the three wide photo finish that went viral, the Netflix documentary at the beginning of the year. We also can't discount the Chase Elliott effect. It is real. Chase Elliott did not race in last year's spring Bristol dirt race and ratings were down like 14%. Pretty much every race Chase Elliott missed last year was down around 10% year over year. The moment Chase Elliott came back, the ratings once again basically broke even. So it's not all the Chase Elliott effect, but you can't ignore the clear trends. It is something. Great to see many of those Chase Elliott fans, I suppose, come back for this year's race. And to see that increase when facing steep competition from March Madness and golf is still a very positive thing to see. That's, I think, three, four races, four cup races in a row that have seen double-digit year-over-year viewership increases. That's huge. Great momentum for NASCAR. We are officially one full month into the 2024 NASCAR car season. Teams have gotten a taste of a variety of tracks, super speedways, mile and a half, short tracks. Consider this the first unofficial checkpoint of the year. A year that's already been full of surprises. The tire wear at Bristol on Sunday is just the latest example. I took a handful of drivers and sorted them into two lists. Drivers who have pleasantly surprised these first few weeks and drivers who've gotten off to unexpectedly slow starts, perhaps. Let's discuss some positive positive surprises and some negative surprises one month into this season. Let's start things off on the right foot. Ty Gibbs has avoided that sophomore slump thus far. Just 21 years old and he's third in the Cup Series standings. Four straight top 10 finishes. He's led 194 laps thus far, which is third most in the entire series. Joe Gibbs racing overall has looked very strong the past three weeks or so, but it has been a pleasant surprise to see young Ty Gibbs right there in the mix, right there with his veteran teammates. He's knocking on the door of that first Cup Series win. I think he gets it sooner rather than later. On the flip side, Zane Smith's rookie season 
couldn't be going much worse. The track house driver racing for Spire this year is dead last in points. Even behind Priest and Gregson who got 35 point penalties. Zane began the year with a solid 13th place run in the Daytona 500 but it's been disastrous ever since. 36th, 29th, 36th, if he's not careful, he's going to win Brock Beard's last car award. <laughs> he's wrecked out twice before halfway. That's the last thing you want to see from a young driver who's still trying to get experience. You need to run all the laps. Expectations are high for Zane Smith. He's older than most modern Cup Series rookies, and he was in the Truck Series Championship for nearly every year. He's a Truck Series champion. He's going to improve this season almost by default. I mean, there's really nowhere to go but up from this point. Another pleasant surprise prize so far this year has been Noah Gregson. Now look, he's 32nd in points. That's terrible. But if not for that 35 point penalty, he'd be like 20th which still isn't great, but expectations for all of Stuart Haas racing were very low coming into this year. And I would say even lower for Noah, who had zero top tens his rookie season with Legacy Motor Club, lost his ride mid-season. His rookie year was a disaster. This year is all about rebuilding his image, rebuilding his confidence. And I think five races into the year, he has done that. The points don't reflect it, but Gregson already has two top 10 finishes on the year, and he had a 12th place at Phoenix. All offseason, fans were focused on Josh Berry, Rookie of the Year contender, Chase Briscoe, longest tenured SHR driver, the only SHR driver in Cup who has a Cup Series win. Noah Gregson was an afterthought. Many expected him to be the third or fourth best guy on the team this year. Again, the points don't reflect it, but speed-wise, you can make an argument Gregson's been the best. Stuart Haas racing forward one month into the season. Did not see that coming. My next negative is Joey Logano. No one's qualified better. First, second, first, fourth, but Joey only has one top 20 finish. A ninth place run at Las Vegas. Joey Logano is way harder to predict these days than he should be. He had that incredible four win championship 2022 season but that's sandwiched in between two kind of disappointing years. 2021, his only victory was that weird inaugural Bristol dirt race. 2023, his only win was a super speedway and he got bounced in the round of 16. Joey Logano is a two-time champion in his prime. Paul Wolf is a NASCAR Cup Series champion. They should be easier to predict than they are. This is looking like one of the longest championship hangovers in modern NASCAR history. I think Todd Gillen deserves a thumbs up. He's led 88 laps on the year. He's led laps in three of the first five races. Still trying to finish races though, like Bristol's a great example. Ran top 10, top five for much of the day, finished 26th. But all of Front Row Motorsports, I think, has surprised us this year. Coming into the season, we didn't expect them to be promoted to tier one Ford status. They deepened that technical alliance with Penske. I think early on this year, you're still seeing some growing pains, some struggles. In talking to Todd Gill and last week on this show, it sounds like Front Row hasn't fully expanded the way Legacy Motor Club did. Like Legacy Motor Club, knowing they were going to be a Toyota key partner, they nearly doubled in size, hired like 50 employees. It sounds like Front Row is still smaller trying to expand, so I expect some growing pains out the gate, but by mid-season later this year, you know, who knows? Front Row could be a consistent top 10 threat. That includes Todd Gillen. We've already seen glimpses of playoff speed. Just gotta finish races, but I'd give Todd Gillen and all of Front Row a thumbs up for the time being. Thumbs down for my guy Sam Mayer. Man, he just cannot shake the DNF demons. He's only finished one of the first four Xfinity Series races. He's crashing out in the opening stage half the time. His luck is bound to turn around eventually. Of course, in racing, you do have to go out and make your own luck. Needs to qualify better. Expectations are high at Junior Motorsports. But after a breakout 2023 that saw Sam Mayer win four Xfinity Series races... I expected him to start 2024 off on the right foot, and the exact opposite has happened so far. I'm going to thumbs up a whole team here, pretty much. Spire Motorsports. Nick Sanchez, Kyle Busch, and Raja Karuth won the first three Craftsman Truck Series races this season, all in Spire trucks. Their Truck Series program obviously expanded in the offseason. They bought Kyle Busch Motorsports, basically absorbed KBM. Spire has quickly built a formidable Truck Series program, and even on the Cup Series, side. I know I mentioned Zane Smith off to a terrible start, unfortunately. Corey LaJoy, you know, has been hit or miss. Same can be said about rookie 
Carson Hosevar, but he does have a couple top 15 finishes already this year. That 77 looks as competitive as it honestly ever has. So some encouraging signs on the cup side of things, but with trucks, looks like Spire is in the early stages of building an empire. Speaking of trucks, or Xfinity in this case, Josh Williams, man. Got the deal with Colleg Racing. He's 30th in Xfinity Series points. He hasn't finished a race on the lead lap yet. Like Sam Mayer, his luck is bound to turn around at least somewhat, but Josh Williams needs to qualify better. His best starting position this year has been 16th. That's not good enough. Not good enough in a Colleg Racing Chevy. And there were comments he made, I think after Las Vegas, that were a little concerning. He basically said that, you know, he's had to drive a car one way for seven years, and now that he's in better equipment, he's had to kind of relearn some things, get adjusted to it. That's understandable. It makes sense, honestly. But you got to run all the laps. Got to stay out of trouble. Get that experience early this season, because by the end of this year, that 11 car should be knocking on the door of a playoff spot, should be contending for wins. Things have been more positive for his Colleg league teammate Shane Van Gisbergen. Full-time in the Xfinity Series this year as he gets adjusted to American stock car racing. Third at Daytona already this year. Twelfth at Atlanta. Had engine issues at Las Vegas. Sixth at Phoenix. And I understand there are some big wrecks and attrition in that race that gifted him some spots, but still, all I expected from SVG this year was to slowly get better at the Oval. Something completely new to him. He's already set a pretty high bar to start the year. He's learning quickly. He's ahead of schedule, in my opinion. A great example is that Phoenix race. I watched him very closely. He qualified 20th and actually ran outside the top 20 for pretty much the entire first half of that race. But then I noticed him start to move forward, run after run. He was inching closer to the top 15. Then he dodged that big wreck on the back straightaway, snuck inside the top 10, and then drove from there into the sixth spot. So within one race, from start to finish, he got noticeably better, noticeably more comfortable. He's a fast learner, I'm telling y'all. And now he's pulling double duty this weekend at Coda. Watch out. We'll end with a negative, unfortunately. Kyle Busch's pit crew. Pit crews, plural, because this team has used five different pit crew combinations through the first five races. And it doesn't seem to matter who they've got in what positions. They're either slow or they're making big mistakes. Three straight finishes outside the top 20. Some of that's the car. Hasn't been comfortable, hasn't been to Kyle Busch's liking, but they've also made mistakes that have cost them important track position. It's hard to get consistent reps and build chemistry on the fly. These are kinks you would have hoped RCR would have worked out during the offseason. RCR on the cup side has struggled out the gates this year, and that number eight pit crew is at the center of many of their problems, it seems. But there you go, some pleasant surprises and unfortunately not so pleasant surprises just one month into the season. Are there any drivers we discussed who you think may fall back down to earth before long? Or any of the struggling drivers, who do you expect to turn things around quickly? Let me know down in the comment section below. Thanks for watching. Leave a like on this video if you enjoyed me. I've been messing with my thumb a lot in this episode. Subscribe if you're new to the channel. We talk NASCAR every single day. And a huge thank you as always to my very generous Patreon supporters. More to come later this week. Circuit of the Americas in just a few days. Excited for NASCAR to be in my home state of Texas once again. Have a wonderful rest of your Tuesday, folks. I'll catch you in the next video.